Um, uh, please bear in mind this is being recorded. Um, so welcome. Um, we're really, really uh, pleased to be here um, and share this with you. Um, we've we've been working for a long time on the um, this, this Evolves tool and the report that came out last year from um, UEA and the East of England Libraries, um, and it it feels like it feels like it's been a bit longer than it should have in terms of getting the tool out to everyone. And it, but it's not really been as straightforward as I think we'd expected or hoped. Um, but we've learned a lot throughout the way. Um, and what we're really, really pleased to do is now be able to share the tool with you um, so that we can start building on it as well. Um, the context of this then is that we've, um, ooh, about getting on for two years ago, um, Libraries Connected East of England, um, led by um, Jill Terrell. Um, so just a big, big thank you to Jill, who's, who's here in the room. Um, came to us um, after they'd got some funding from the Arts Council to look at the impact of libraries um, and, and demonstrating the value of the um, of that libraries bring to communities and to society as well. Um, from that, um, they were able to commission some amazing research from University of East Anglia. Um, the research was funded not just by the Arts Council, but actually mainly from the libraries themselves. Um, so the libraries put in a big chunk of money um, across the east of England and really owned the research and owned the stuff that came out of it as well. Felt like a really positive way to to do this kind of research as well, rather than it being something imposed on the sector. It's something that came really from the sector and and highlighted what the libraries um, were really trying to trying to establish and demonstrate. Um, there was a number of areas that the libraries wanted to look at originally. I think we ended up with about seven or eight different aspects that we wanted to understand the value of. Um, we whittled it down um, through a series of discussions between the libraries and um, UEA to try and understand what the value is of, um, of libraries in terms of digital inclusion, health and wellbeing, and also children's literacy. Um, and so bringing it into those kind of three dimensions made a, a massive difference in being able to focus it down but it's also given us not just the research that's come out but it's given us the basis of a really helpful tool which we see as kind of a tool that will start to grow and start to build as we do other research and feed in the results of the, that other research into the tool as well um so the tool itself um is not quite where we need it to be yet we're getting there and it's uh you might see there's still a couple of little glitches in it um, as we go through today, but what we really wanted to do was get it out and get people to start using it so we can start a community practice to kind of de develop what works with it, um, how we can use it most effectively, um, and also feed in new bits around it as well. So as you'll have seen from the communication that came out from Nick yesterday, um, everyone's been invited or is going to be invited to a base camp where the tool will be held. If you use the tool um, to demonstrate and, and calculate the value of your own library services or test out different things then please do upload your um your results from the tool back into there as well um but also start discussions and start asking why is this working this way or why why does how do we put this kind of thing in how do we use it in this way and and what else we might be able to use it for as well so do start those discussions on the base cup as well because we do really want to develop that as a really a, a community of practice but again, this tool is not, we don't see it as an isolated tool um, or kind of an end in itself. Um, we kind of see this as fitting within a broader, um, a really kind of a broader strategy of trying to understand more widely the benefits that libraries bring to society. Um, the more we can understand that, we can more that we can then feed through into policy and hopefully into funding decisions, but also into how we can then refine and develop the services that we offer through libraries as well. Um, so we are really keen to commission other bits of research. Bits of research. We're talking to another couple of regional uh, groups of libraries about um, different aspects of research that would build on and add to the work that's been done um, already. Um, and we're also looking at how we can bring in external research. So there's re research happening at the moment uh, with Strathclyde University about the impact of closure of libraries on societies and communities, um, and also research that we're working with Edinburgh University in disseminating around the impact of reading for pleasure on well-being and different age groups as well. So we're trying to work out if we can if we can use this base camp as kind of a 
an engaged group to then feed this through to then get that those messages and that research out to the sector as well. So we're trying to bring all of these things together into one place. At the moment, though, we're focusing on the, the eVolves tool. Um, before we I'll pass across to um, Rick from uh, Creative or from UEA, um, I just want to do a couple of big thanks. So big thanks to um, Arts Council England for supporting and funding the initial piece of work, uh, initial piece of research. Um, and a really big thanks to the East of England Libraries to, for pulling together and, and coming up with this and really driving it and funding it themselves. And within that, an enormous thanks um, to Jill Terrell, who has been a personal driver for a lot of this as well. So um, just want to say a massive thanks there as well. Um, and thanks today as well to Lily Troop for joining us uh, from Norfolk Libraries as well, um, who's going to be um, working through the tool um, Again, working through the tool in a very live way as well. So there might be things that go wrong. There might be things that work. There might be things that just that don't, don't work at all. But it's about us taking you through the tool and it being a really worked worked example of that as well. And then also a big thanks to Creative UEA. Uh, so I don't know, John Gordon's on the on the call here. Um, he's our main contact at Creative UEA, who's um, a consultancy that works alongside and within University of East Anglia to provide access to all the academics within the, the university. Um, and Rick Fordham, um, who is going to be leading the um, the webinar and is the, the main person who's been responsible for creating the eVolves tool within his team. He's moved on from UEA now, but still very much engaged in the, the area of research and very much linked back into um, Creative UEA as well. So without further ado, I will pass on to Rick. And if you want to um, introduce yourself and then just take us through the, um, the eVolves tool. Thanks, Ian. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope it's going to be a good session and uh, interesting to spend your hard-earned lunch breaks on. Um, I'm pretty sure we'll we'll find something uh, useful to to all, all of us. will find something useful out of it. I'm just going to share my screen, um, and then I can get get going. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes, that's a thumbs up. Yeah, big, big black screen. Uh, so I just let me just put it on uh, uh, presentation mode. Uh, as as Ian has said, I recently left, and so in fact as the co-creator with uh, with um, also George Sidopoulos, uh, UEA. Um, although I still retain uh, links with UEA, quite formal links, but uh, I am. For all intents and purposes, retired. Um, and before that, I was the director of health economics consulting, which was a, we talked about the um, library, uh, the uh, creative UEA consultancy. Well, we were kind of another brand, another consultancy at UEA in the health world. So my background is health uh, and health economics in particular. Uh, so we created. Um, so I was brought into this. Uh, this project because of the creative UEA project and, and there was an element to libraries in promoting health and John asked me if I would help uh, sort of evaluate that aspect of it as it turned out we did that uh, with a very a variety of projects that we, we were focused in um, on sorry uh, but it, it became apparent that we really needed a value tool for all services and all, all uh, activities that as much as we could, uh, that libraries deliver, not just anything to do with health. Um, and as as George and I have a common background, not in economic uh, health economics, but we trained as economists, and so we thought we we would try and take on the challenge of doing it uh, for the other two areas that we that, that were being looked at under the under the uh, Creative UEA project, uh, the uh, the uh, value of libraries. Um, and so that's how it emanated, and and that's where we are. As this is where we got to, we got to the something that ended up being called the economic evaluation of library services, which all sounds a bit dry and technical. Uh, we gave it the we like giving things abbreviated names, so we call it the evolves uh, model. Uh, every time I put evolves in, uh, my spell checker checker changes it to evils. Um, so I have to, uh, have to be careful of that one, uh, but that's the that's what it stands for. 
Um, and it's the, it's the idea that we can actually get a value, an economic value um, out of, out of the, 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 the daily activities that go on in libraries. And some of you might, might be already thinking, well, how the hell do you do that? Um, and that was our first question as well. How do we do this? Um, through a series of discussions, we, we, we did manage to find a pathway through and have developed that. Um, so as, as I'm going to, as Jill's going to just talk about, I'll just, I'll, I'll stop sharing for a minute. Uh, this library is for living and for, uh, for, for living better was something that came out of this partnership, um, which the three, the three organizations essentially, uh, of which I was one, only one part of that and not, not the overall, uh, director either. That was John Gore, Professor John Gordon, who I think is on the call today, on the uh, meeting today in the room. Anyway, I'll, I'll shut up for a minute and let Jill take over, give us a bit more background on, on that report. Thank you. Um, thanks, Rick. Thanks for introducing me. Um, Ian's given you quite a lot of background actually already. So I'll just mention um, a couple of years ago, I was working as the chair of the working group. I was head of Norfolk Libraries. I've since moved on, so I'm working independently now with Libraries Connected, but very pleased to come back uh, to support the work around this impact and evaluation in libraries. So thank you for inviting me on the call. Um, I think it's important to say the 11 authorities in Libraries Connected East all have different governance models and different sizes. Um, and that sector really put together some money, worked with the Regional Arts Council in order to get some grant. And in fact, DCMS were involved in the early stages as well and were very helpful in shaping the whole tender process and going out to commission. It was really interesting working with a, a sort of new to the sector academic team in, in Creative UEA and alongside Rick's team in Health Economics Consulting. This Libraries for Living report came out June last year. It got some good media coverage. The bookseller picked it up, The Guardian picked it up, and uh, you'll have seen uh, some big figures uh, around the, the valuation of libraries at the time. Oh, thank you. Stop, stop sharing, Rick. Thank you very much. Um, so where we are today is what we really want is the ambition was to have a model that all of you could use in the services so some of you will have more background to this report than others i can see on the list there are new participants to this so you really want to see the demonstration at all if you're interested in more of the background and and thinking there is um, a webinar from last year on libraries connected youtube channel so you can see all the background thinking but what i wanted to do today was really to say when you see the tool today and lily really has volunteered to demonstrate um, a project that she's been leading on the ground and to apply it to the tool what you see in the report are some very detailed detailed case studies and i would say when you use the tool do proceed with caution but do use it as Ian was saying, it's really about using it and trying to expand on it so that we can demonstrate the value and the economic value of um, a whole range of activities that go on in libraries. My suggestion is that some of you might like to start with the case studies where UEA and Rick and his team have done the hard work around the clear evidence for the value per participant. And I had to get my head around this. Value per participant is an economic thing. If you work in libraries, it might not be something you've come across before. Um, and then if you work on those case studies and build the evidence base for you locally and for Libraries Connected nationally, I think there's real strength in the tool as it stands today to build on those case studies. And they're around digital inclusion, children's literacy, health and well-being. In terms of expanding that and exploring the determination of value per participant for a wider activity, this demonstration will really help. That's what Lily's bringing to the table today. This is something that wasn't in the case studies. We're going to put the figures into the tool, see what we get and see how you can use it. So that's exploring the sort of wider use of the tool. I would just say, remember always to use it in conjunction with the report so that you really understand what the figures are telling you and 
um, to be cautious about the assumptions that are being made. And I'm as guilty as the next person of saying, I've got this fabulous figure, I can prove these marvellous things for libraries, but just be careful that you keep it in the context of the report. So I just give you that tip. Um, I would say when you start to explore and expand the use of it, just make sure you can clearly evidence your values. You all work in libraries, you're all brilliant at citing resources, you will all have supported others in, in finding information and being able to, to um, get to the background. So just be careful that you can clearly evidence your values that you use in the tool. And the other word of um, slight caution or tip I would give you is that my understanding is that evolves as a tool doesn't subtract your costs. So again, if you're, you know, if you're claiming a million pounds worth of value in your branch library, you know, just be careful that doesn't take into account the running costs of a branch library, for instance. So when you when you use the tool, um, just be aware of the costs as well as the values. Um, there will be a, a user guide that comes out on the base camp. I think Nick's already sent um, sent a link to. So perhaps we can talk a bit more about that once you've seen the tool and you've got questions. And I think we've held back slightly on the user guide just because this seminar will probably um, you know, enable us to make it even stronger by the time we publish it rather than putting out a guide. Then people ask lots of questions today and we think, oh, we could have put that in the guide. So um, that will follow very shortly. So that's all I really wanted to say. Um, and hopefully, Rick, I've stated the right things and set the context for you and Lily to do your demonstration, but I'm happy to answer any questions in the Q&A when we get to it. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Jill. Uh, no, that was absolutely um, all, all good. Um, I'm just going to find my presentation again. There it is. Um, so as Jill has just mentioned, it, it, it does very much depend on this is, it's not all comprehensive, by the way. Uh, that that's the thing. There be there will be lots of um, opportunities for I'm sure other people with other ideas about the value of, of libraries that are not in the model, um, and things that uh, dimensions to value that we don't we don't currently capture, and that's also something we're very keen in the future to 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 look at and, and incorporate them in into the model. And, and and the other thing is, yeah, keep those case studies coming as well. If you if you do use the model and you have got a case study, uh, don't worry whether it's been replicated somewhere else because it could be you know very useful to see what how that compares. So I wouldn't uh, I would encourage people to to contribute to case studies if they can, uh, and think around think around the thinking that we've been we've been doing on the model. Uh, it is still um, evolving. <laughs> Sorry about the play on words, um, and we we hope it will evolve further. So um, we talked about the report. Sorry, uh, the services that we we include in the model at the moment are these eleven value domains, and there uh, there could well be an, uh, another one as well. We might have missed, but I, I counted eleven this morning. Um, and those are the things that tradi traditionally, well, no, maybe not traditionally, but these are things that you might think about, like libraries providing uh, the kind of services they might offer. Obviously, they can be nuanced in, in different uh, areas and places. Uh, they may not apply to everybody, uh, but we felt anyway that uh, during this research that these probably would be the best ones uh, that we could hang some evidence on um bearing in mind that that's what drives the model is the evidence it's not us making stuff up uh or or any other way of doing it we're trying to look for evidence here um and so th those you know they they speak for themselves i won't read them out i don't think we need to um i think they're all fairly clear if anybody has any questions perhaps we can take take those later at the end um but uh we'll go to the next slide when we estimated that we, we did a we did a for the for the re report we did a, a sort of a national estimate and it was a bit crude uh it was based on the average kind of library operating 
in in sort of a bigger library situation, and scaling that, excuse me, and scaling that up to the uh, across the across the country, we came up with this figure that caught the headlines, as I think someone said, um, of three and a half, nearly three and a half billion pounds worth of benefit. So as you can imagine, that's quite a, an eye watering amount of of money. But then again, uh, you know, there's a lot of libraries and there's a lot of value going on in libraries. So it didn't surprise us particularly, but it was certainly something that the press and others picked up on. And it's a nice figure to use, but use it warily. Um, and anyway, so we'll go on to the next. So how did we work all this out? I think it's good that you get a little bit of background. We, as I've said already, we used the, the best economic evidence we could find. That meaning we had to look, we looked at reports and papers, literature that included something to do with the economics and, and prefer, well, had to include something to do with costs, had, had to monetize those things in some way. Um, and and so that's that's how we chose the, the references that we chose. Um, they had to be good studies. We hope that we were discerning enough to pick good studies and, and get rid of the some of the poorer quality ones. Um, we we often check their methods, so we wouldn't just take a paper or a report at face value. We would sort of just you know kick kick the tires around a bit and make sure that it it was sensible and that it was doing what it said on the tin. Um, as I said, we, it had to include some monetary values, otherwise we couldn't work with non-monetary values in a, in, in, in a sort of spreadsheet kind of way. Um, oftentimes, it looked at the, these, the, the, the evidence that we included would have looked at return on investment. Not always, but a lot of the time they were trying to make a return on investment kind of estimate. And again, we looked at those carefully. We didn't want to, we didn't want to include anything that was too you know, too glib or too uh, cavalier about return on investment, um, and we worked. We'd, we'd, we'd work out how they how they how they did that. Um, we adopted the, the whole calculation in the in the in what became the model specifically to uh, libraries. So some of these studies weren't, in fact, the evidence wasn't in, wasn't just in libraries. In fact, it might have been in social care. It might have been in schools. It might have been somewhere else. But we, what we were trying to do was to align it to the libraries to make sure that it did line up with something that would be similar in a library. So if something was way beyond what a library would would, would deliver, we wouldn't use it in our libraries model. Okay. So there were some health things, for example, which we're more a bit more familiar with, that we're talking about. You know, suicide prevention of young people or something which is a fairly heavy topic um, and also requires some fairly heavy duty care. And we wouldn't expect the same kind of algorithm to happen in, in a library. So we would discard that kind of evidence. It was only something that we thought could be translated into a library that would work. And um, we were always highly conservative with those estimates that we use. If they gave a range, we'd, we'd use the lower end of the range, not the higher. So we're not egging, over egging the cake uh, too much. Uh, from from that we went to the data from actual libraries that we were working with in the study in in the study that Jill's talked about report. Um, so we had actual data from those particular sites. Um, we would gather evidence of use, what foot, 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 I'm supposed to say footfall, uh, uh, footfall or or other type of evidence that of turnover, if you like, of of, of utilization of, of libraries of these particular schemes in the libraries. Um, and we would make an estimate of the costs of running those. So we would actually ask people, and we're gonna see that in a moment from Lil with Lily, you know, how much does this cost? You know, what do you think are the costs that you should include uh, in this? And, um, you know, press people about that a bit to make sure that we were getting a sort of consistent story. Um, we actually, we as I said, we assess, uh, assess the actual likely benefits with the literature um, examples. So, um, to make to just to cross check that really we were getting kind of similar figures, um, which also helped us make sure that we the literature kept everything uh, straight and narrow on that. Um, and we applied the most uh, what we call the most reasonable ROI again. 
we did in our it's not in the current version for some reason it, it got taken out along the way and it will be put back in shortly but we were going to have an, a, an roi uh tab or a, a field where it would show you the return on investment so the comment that, uh, that, that what, what jill said about observing about doesn't take account of that it should do it should take account of your costs it should net off your costs give you the net benefits and then divide by the costs to give you a return on investment um and so we we had all this we had all this data we had all this information both from the literature and from actual libraries that we were encountering in the study and doing all this work with we thought well it has to go somewhere and it ended up going in typically for economists end up going in a spreadsheet um and we thought well we could just present an answer the answer is x but in fact We've been used to building various models a lot in the last 10, 15 years for different types of purposes. And we thought, no, this is this would lend itself to an interactive model. It would mean that people could put their own values in, they could take their own services and start populating it with their own information so that they would have a, a useful tool. And it wouldn't just be something that a figure that gets put into a report and forgotten about it would be a, a living model that we could it could have life beyond the study so that's how it we created it it's it doesn't look very flash at the moment i have to say it does look like a spreadsheet a bit uh there's a little bit of tech going on in terms of simulation going on in the background if you want it um but and you can get chapter and verse from us if you want all that kind of stuff uh but it doesn't look particularly flash uh, as you'll see, uh, but it does do what 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 lies behind it are is is this this is this kind of method that we've gone through with each of the value propositions, if you like, uh, for the different services and work them out. So you don't need to be flash when you've got when you've done that kind of work, as long as you know where you're sourcing your evidence from. Um, but it will it will it, it will uh, no doubt change as time goes on. So I think that's. Oh, there's one more slide, sorry. So you'll see this in a minute. We're gonna look at this. This is the kind of input page that we, we're using. As I say, so each of those domains that I talked about, the 11 domains, breaks down, we broke, we broke those down into sub domains, if you like, or sub areas um, to try and say, well, because it was too big, a, this, you know, while having one category was too big. So computing and digital education, you know, it, it covers so much. Uh, it, it encompasses so many different types of uh, events and so many different types of activities that go on in libraries that it would be really meaningless to keep it at that level. So we had to take it down to the next level. Through our research, we we came to these kind of uh, these kind of um, categories, um, and then we had to ask ourselves, okay, well these are the things that you might do, but how do you measure them? So these are the me second column is the measurement. Uh, this is there, once you've got how do you measure it, uh, you can then put the measure in, the actual value. So uh, you can start putting figures in. And then the magic bit, I suppose, is the value. And that's the bit that's predicated on all the research we did. And we don't ask you to change that uh, because that's something that is built into the model. And then basically it's a multiplication. And it will then um, generate... Um, as I say, it will, uh, a total, it will then generate um, graphs of, of, for, for, you know, presentations of that information in different ways. And it will eventually, hopefully soon, have a return on investment uh, module in it as well. So this is the screen you really need to focus in on when you go into the model, because this will, this will, what you put in here determines what appears in the rest of the model, okay? Um, and we're going to show you that it's not always just it's yeah you know, it's straightforward enough, but it's not that straightforward to think about these kind of things. Oh, and the costs as well. Uh, so they are the costs. Sorry, um, we'll, we'll 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 talk about those costs in a minute. Uh, I think for now I'll stop sharing. Um, any questions just before I, of any sort of factual. Any information you want to know just before we go into the model, I'm happy to take uh, quickly now, if you like.
If there's anything burning that people don't understand. If not, we can, I'll just talk, I'll hand you over to Lily just to introduce the case study, if you like, what we're going to do next. Thanks, Lily. Any questions at all from anybody? No hands up? Right, okay. That's the case, we'll move on. Over to you, Lily. Right. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm Lily. I'm a digital inclusion coordinator for Norfolk Libraries. Um, and the example that I have brought with me today uh, is our online safe and in control project, um, which is a digital inclusion project that's just come to an end in Norfolk. So through this project, uh, it was commissioned by Ofcom along with 12 other organizations uh, to help improve online media literacy among groups who, at the mo who are at the most risk of online harm. So between February 23 and March 24, we ran uh, 392 one-to-one -one digital skills support sessions specifically for older adults um, at four library branches. And the aim was to get people online uh, and to broaden their internet use while helping them to avoid scams and misinformation. So um, I got some information with me about how much money we spent and how many sessions we ran. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen um, with the Evils tool and Rick's gonna walk me through how to yeah, plug in my info. Okay. So bear with me while I share my screen. We were having some problems with the enabling the macros, so um, it was just a corporate thing, but Lily's obviously found a way around that, so hopefully. Well, I have, I've, I've clicked enable macros, so um, hopefully that's all that's needed, but we'll see. We don't um, have, it doesn't have immediately the value table that we were looking at just now, really. I think you may have to disable the macros. It's, so, it knocks it knocks the tabs out, unfortunately, if you enable the macros for some reason. I can see the tabs at the bottom of the screen here. Yeah, but I don't think the one that we want to, to use is there. Okay. Um, but it's something, something, there's something, there's some glitch going on at the moment which doesn't allow the macros to ena be enabled on some people's machines without losing some of the tabs at the bottom. And one of them is the very screen that we need to look at to put stuff in. So if I jump in at this point and I can share my screen because I've got, I've enabled macros and, and mine is showing that. So, Yours works, okay. Yeah, so I, I can share my screen and then we can. All right, yeah. just thank you for that. that, that's great. You can tell this is a live demonstration, can't you? Yes. Right. Okay. That's got all the bits on. Brilliant. If we can go to the values activities page, Ian, I I think we'll just jump to that and we'll go back through at the other pages, but they really are um a lot of it's for information. So okay, Lily. Um you would have some some of information you mentioned. Obviously, we're going to be looking in the um, media. Are we? Or no, we're going down to the what's what's scroll down a bit. Could you in computer, computer that's, that's and right. digital education? Yes, of course. Right. I guess it's a question of picking a category in that. Yeah, so I think um, computer education or computer digital literacy. Um, okay. I don't know those other figures are in there for. I would just take those out for the time being, if you can just get rid of those, Ian. And the one above. we we'll start from a blank cell. Um, so, and the, the title at the top, you can't see because you're too down. If we can have to scroll up again, Ian. <laughs> uh, There's a title missing. Oh, there it is. So, can we um, 
Can you um, tell us a bit about, about the numbers again? Could just remind us how many yeah. people? So we're, we ran 392 sessions and we're going to work on the assumption that it's one person per session. I think in reality, we had people coming back for repeat sessions but because we weren't um, tracking that. We'll just assume that it's one one person per session. So it's 392, um, I guess, would that be your units? And these um, were just, just all sessions. We don't know whether they were, as you say, some people used up to about three, didn't they, I think? Yeah, it, it did vary, but I think the majority will have been one or two sessions per person. So it, it's probably best to just work on on that assumption. But yeah, so it's 392 in the year. Um, and then the total, well, the total spend was around £9,760, um, which if you divide that by 392, the number of people you get um, about £25 spent. Okay, that doesn't go in there, unfortunately, and that goes in somewhere else. So we're looking at the value here that should be um, automatically put in and I'm not sure it was 379 pounds I think we took out wasn't it um can we put that back in so you know straightforward calculation would say that we're you're generating um nearly 150,000 pounds worth of value this is based on the closest comparable uh, value that we found in 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 uh, media education for sorry computing and digital education for adults uh in that in that area so uh if we go to the return on investment results ian on the tab below, uh, bottom tab can we put in uh your estimated costs lily um mm -hmm. What what were you what were you um and I see that the the figure hasn't translated through in either to the benefits, so one hundred and forty eight thousand I think was the top would be the to non would be the numerator, one hundred and forty eight roughly wasn't it, and what were your costs you said approximately Lily, yeah so it was nine thousand seven hundred and sixty pounds. Okay, and that just just tell us a little bit how that was made up, roughly speaking. How did yeah, you... so um, we I, I thought about we thought about the difference between kind of the the marginal cost and the full cost. So that yeah. that number does not include the overheads, of, you know, having the library open because that's already a given. Um, yeah. we're just using the marginal costs, which were the staffing because it was extra staffing. Mm -hmm. um, and travel to some symposia that were kind of part of Ofcom's yeah. program. Yeah. yeah. The basis of that was we did we had discussed this a little bit before was that Lily felt that these staff were already employed, um, but you're taking them away from something else they could be doing. So they're doing these activities, and so it's right that you cost them into it, uh, and some of the consumables that you've mentioned, but. But and that and, and the, the time really is what we're based on the time of the start and anything else that is necessary to run those sessions rent uh, if you're going to mm -hmm. if, if you were for example going to take it out of the library and put it into a, a branch library you might want to include some some travel costs or some time for those uh for that for that for the running of that uh, elsewhere but we didn't we we talk about average and marginal costs average costs are everything like rent heating lighting whatever it might be divided into the activity we'll, or to give a sort of average cost or we just look at the things that you need incrementally or marginally to deliver that program and yeah. we felt that and the, the reason i think that go on. sorry no, <laughs> the go reason on. i think that made sense to me was was because if I'm going to take this, you know, if I'm going to use this tool to demonstrate the value of this project, and I might use that to maybe approach other funders to try and get some more funding for it, I wouldn't be asking those people, those funders to, you know, keep the library open longer than it is, or, you know, I would just be asking um, 
for the extra marginal cost that we would need to run it. So that's why I think in this instance, it makes sense to exclude those kind of overheads. Exactly. That's a perfect example. I mean, you know, other people may find that they may, may feel for whatever the, whatever program they're running, they might need to include those, uh, those overhead costs. Or if you are doing indeed an extension at the weekend, you wouldn't normally open the library on a Sunday or something, then that would be legitimate to include. Uh, we're running at a bit of uh, time constraint. So as you can see, if you're just putting those figures in, you're getting a return of £15 for every £1 spent or a net return of 14 actually. Uh, there is a, uh, there's a sort of an interest discounting factor thing going on as well, which um is 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 sort of taking uh, changing things a bit but not to worry about that so essentially um we could we using this tool this is what you this is what you can get out of it and this is what you can help to uh to 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 work with your particular uh projects that you're interested in um i i think Lily, have you got anything else to add to this now? Would you, would you be as a as a as a librarian responsible for this pro project? Would you be would you be happy with something like this if you would say wanting to use it for a, making a case again for running such a a service? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, like Jill said earlier, the important thing is knowing that you're you know the case studies that you're using to get that um uh, that uh, kind of return on investment that or that economic value actually apply to you know or are a close enough fit to the to the activity that you're delivering and um, mm. because i know we looked at uh, using digifest uh, and Norfolk libraries digifest as an example mm. um, but unfortunately this we still need to find kind of a more a proven proven mm. value um or an example where the value has been proven mm. for kind of that uh, stem education or computer uh, computer education for children because the case study for um computer education here is 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 for adults and um, yeah. So yeah just just look at look into the case studies i think is is definitely the first step yeah that it's very it's very easy to get carried away with values across uh, a lot of the reports that we looked at got carried away with giving a value for the rest of someone's life you know and or their employment value um and it that's my that may be valid but in some cases it it might just be drawing it drawing a too long a bow if they say as they say it's just uh it, you might want to have something a little bit more immediate what's the immediate benefit to to people rather than how's it going to benefit them in the future in 10 years time in their employment and this is what we found with the the one that you mentioned um uh which, which was for children but a lot of the estimates were saying well the lifetime benefits of this are, are you know x and we didn't feel that that was too appropriate in this particular, because for a one-off session or a couple of sessions, you can't make that assumption, presumption that you, you know, you're going to change someone's whole approach to their career or something. Uh, so we had to be, you know, careful with that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to, I think, hand back to the to Nick or Ian to sort of bring us back to where we need to be to sort of wrap this up before you know, before the hour, really, with questions. So, uh, and Thanks, Rick. That's OK. Hi. Hi. All right. I'm Nick Partridge. I'm one of the regional development managers at Libraries Connected. So um, I'm going to just jump in uh, Q&A. We've got a question for you, Rick, from uh, Antonio Rizzo in the chat. And it's uh, probably about, can you please clarify if you have set values for specific areas of the country? So that, that figure we saw of three, six, nine, pounds per value per unit mm. he's saying is you know 300 pound unit in a rural area may be equivalent to 350 for central london or 250 depending on the nature of the program area so have you you know got one figure for the whole country or, or have you got any variation not at the moment and in, in short no we haven't and it's a really good question antonio um i think it's a something we need to look at uh, we do do this in other models where we know that the wage rates or um, you know costs vary in different parts of the country we haven't gone to that level of sophistication mm -hmm. yeah and, and i think 
for, for myself, I've just had a, a quick look at the tool as well. Um, that figure, uh, the multiplication figure of 369, came from some validated uh, research, didn't it? That actually, um, in the tool, you specify where that figure came from. Yes, it's in the tool. I can't remember offhand, uh, Nick, uh, which one, which report that was now. But it's yeah. definitely not just something we plucked out of thin air. No. I mean, of course, if people have better estimates, we're not saying they shouldn't use them, but they always need to make sure that they've referenced where they come from. Yes. So for the 11 domains or the 11 uh, case studies, each one of those has that, you know, value per unit uh, programmed into the into the tool, doesn't it? So it does. Yeah. Yeah, I just wonder whether, Ian, if you're still there, whether you could share the tool again and just have a look at the case studies tab, because I think that might be quite useful for people just to see the range that's already pre-populated. Um, so, yeah, so this is the the case study. So these were the 11 that Rick, you know, detailed, and each one has a value per participant, as you can see, which is the second uh yellow box down there and uh comment as to where it's come from um so this is if you like detailing all the the the, the research that was done um so therefore justify justifying the the, the figures uh that you'd calculate calculate yeah. from your usage isn't it yes indeed yeah mm. yeah um yeah so you can see a couple of them are using the sure start program which is was well validated um uh, big study that came out Oh, I don't know now, a few years ago, but, uh, you know, we. the other thing I didn't mention, we have uprated all the costs and the benefits. So we would um, bring those to a current base year of, I don't know, 23, I think it was last year when the study took place. So that any benefits have been inflated from the, from the original studies that may have been done previously. So Lily's example, if we just scroll down, uh, Ian, uh, fitted the uh, digital, whereas the, the, the original premise of using Digifest didn't quite fit. So here we have, yeah, the computer digital literacy um, calculations here. So in, so there's the three, seven, nine pounds that, that uh, came from it. Yeah. 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 Which was a, you know, a very good study done by Capita Economics, who are a pretty reputable group mm -hmm. in London doing big, big work for government all the time. So we, we checked them out. <laughs> So in, in terms of, yes, and on this, this page, thanks Ian, you can see that the, I think the, the, the pound value per unit, I think maybe that column, column I, we would probably not encourage people to change those without having that research uh, uh, of understanding that. So it's the volume unit that Lily changed, wasn't it, from the computer literacy, the 392 pounds, which would then ripple through to the cost. So I think that probably a change we would make uh, in uh, as the evolves tool evaluates is probably to lock down that that column, um, mm. so that you you just don't change it by accident, but actually you have a a, a predicate or, or or a rationale for changing it if you need to change it. Yeah. Yes, indeed. I mean, the other way you can use this tool is as as, as to sort of for future planning. So if you wanted to work out the minimum number of people you have to have through a program in order to break even mm -hmm. uh you could you could do it like that you know uh you could yeah. you could say well you want my program's going to cost i don't know half a million pounds or whatever, quarter of a million whatever uh and you'd, you'd need to put through 470 people before you could get the benefit of it back you know you know so there's another way of using the tool uh, there's plenty of ways you could use it mm -hmm. both for planning and retrospective um evaluation Got another question in the chat. Uh, Jacqueline, I don't know, do you want to ask it? So if you can tell funders that you're necessary to quickly indicate the, the authority value of metrics, what scope of intention is there for the first reference? True sign for 692. Not sure whether everybody would have heard that, but. Um, um, I didn't you... hear it, no. No, no, no. <laughs> um, sorry, I read it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit. Um, I think it. The, the authority. Come off mute and try to um yeah. uh, uh, explain a little. I'm just um yeah 
I'm just thinking that when I'm I'm crafting a um a pitch as it were for a, a, a library's product um uh, and I'm trying to indicate to the external funder investor that it's going to be a good you know valuable yeah, um, uh, investment I often use you know things like the good thing foundations dairy school or something like that and I find that I will um uh, even if the if the form allows or the, the method of communication allows put links into it and that kind of thing it, there's something about um not every potential funder investor to our sector will have familiarity with this project so it's about how do we quickly and easily communicate to them the authority that a metric that's come through this tool has that's a good question um Apart from facts, Jill, perhaps it's a question for you. I don't know. Is it is part of the authority that you UEA have invested in it um, and the research that we've done in it, and it's out there in the public domain? I'm not sure how else we would do that. Um, I I would say, Rick, if I were uh, Jacqueline, if I were in your shoes, I think the fact that um, UEA have an academic kind of independence to the sector and looked at it and it's it's been produced through a, a verified source if you like so um i would i would rely on the um academic credentials of the the report i think that's that's where i would go with that um could i could i just add that of course there's going to be an academic publication coming out i didn't know if that what might you might be going to say ian sorry but um I think that's that's going to be important to reference as well. Uh, that's brilliant. Um, I wonder whether it's worth us having a um, a referenceable page on our website that then just kind of links through to the report, um, the the workings behind the tool, and then also can link through to the um, academic paper as well. So basically, just somewhere that we can hold centrally as sort of like that's that's just something that you can refer funders and things to as well. Um, I just wanted to quickly pick up on what Antonio had said in the chat as well, because I think that feels like that's a similar question about whether we're encouraging all library services to start using the toolkit to get a common baseline and historical trajectory and would sit for benefit from adopting and monitoring it. Um, I think at the moment we're trying to get people to test it out, use it out, see how it works and, and start to get a sense of what we feel it's beneficial to do and what what you find it works for and what you're, you're finding it's um where you're finding it's gaining traction and, and having a real influence you might you might find that when you put it together and for certain audiences they don't respond very well to it um in which case we can then again support with more referencing and, and kind of um citing the um the academic research behind it um but there might be things that you find it's it's actually really useful for as well, which we can then start to push uh, things into as well. Um, and then also that that broader thing about SIPFRA and having external monitoring of it is a really interesting question. I think we always need to explore how we do that and explore how we keep it as a as a a reference and authoritative um, tool um, without it being. Um, too far away from the library sector for it to be of use so it's that kind of thing just um sorry nick i'll just get you back we we've got a hand up um our adams do you want to ask your question uh yeah thank you sorry it's a bit too long for me to type it out for you um so i'm quite familiar with using a social value engine which this obviously is another kind of version of um, on the tool that I'm used to using, there are certain like um, safeguards to stop you from overclaiming. Um, so just to use something that I'm familiar with, um, like you know, um, there is a proxy there for a value of you know reading a book every two weeks. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so we can put in with got like, X amount of participants that have done this and get the value out of the other end. Mm -hmm. But there is a mechanism there for saying, well, actually, we can't claim all of this value because they're not get just getting their books from the library. They're getting their yeah. books from other sources. Yeah, so you absolutely. can kind of deflate that value. Is there a mechanism in this model for that? Uh, that's one of the difficulties. No, that I don't. We haven't built it in. It's one of the difficulties we had with attributing value to library services was did it all come you hit the nail on the head did it all come from 
yeah, it's but unlikely to come from one source, you know, something like reading or even digital media or, or, or whatever it might be uh, that other people can, you can access elsewhere. Um, that's why we kept the case studies as focused as possible on things that you did in libraries. Uh, but but notwithstanding that, your, your question is still valid. It, yeah. it, we don't have we don't have a sort of control factor on that. Um, yeah, even like just thinking about Lily's yeah. example with um with their digital sessions again, it's like, well, how many mm. people will have gone away and then got educated as well via their family, or yeah. like, how many people attended from even out of area that you know were library members and things like that. So that's kind of what I'd be worried yeah. about. That would be overclaiming. Um, yeah, we. That's why uh, we have try to sort of say, look, don't look at the long term benefits, you know, unless it's apps, you know, unless and unless unless it's where the thing is uh, is focused on. Uh, if it if it gives you short term benefits and maybe some long term benefits, you're claiming don't claim the long term, you know, the, the sort of the bigger picture benefits. Claim the the immediate ones if you like. Yeah. Uh, and, and leave those others out because otherwise you could be over egging it that's how we've worked it it, it is a problem I, I grant you it's a really good question mm. we've... I think you know I think part of my problem with only understanding is it is I often haven't actually had the opportunity to read the report that you published last year so I think mm. that would be really helpful for me but I've no doubt that I'll have further questions from reading that yeah. as well so yeah <laughs> thank you yeah I mean, there could be smart ways of doing it, but you know, I still think the best way is to is is the way that is intuition rather than trying to sort of be too overly overly clever about building in something into the model which would decay the function, you know, decay how much impact it had over time or something like that, which you know statistically might be look fancy and and neat, but actually is probably just as much it's, it's probably only as good as a guess anyway yeah i wonder if there's something else we could we could do as well just in terms of if we're putting together that page together i, I wonder whether on the base camp we could collectively come up with a almost like a set of caveats of or to contextualize it so we're saying yeah. this is what was in with the caveat that it links back to this research um there are these other facts all that kind of thing so maybe to have something about where we we put together a shared a shared almost like a shared statement of how we're presenting the information as well which yeah. then feels like that'd be much a, a responsible yeah. way to do that as well mm -hmm. right i'm conscious of time we're nearly there the hour and thank you for your 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 lunch time just before we move on from that lily thank you very much for your um input there um did you feel that, that figure of about one hundred and forty nine thousand pounds worth of uh, value um felt big or, or little or, or how, how does it... um it is it's i guess it is hard to say but i am currently um kind of we did a lot of really really uh detailed evaluation into um these sessions so surveying customers doing follow-up interviews that kind of thing um and i think I, yeah I, I don't want to like over inflate it but i do think that the the economic value is isn't small like i mean we had yeah. plenty of people who went on to get jobs um and yeah. obviously they are receiving potentially support from other in other areas as well but um mm -hmm. i definitely think you can make the argument that without our support those things wouldn't have happened yeah um, so yeah i, I do have a, a, i think a reasonable degree of confidence in it you know? good Good. And I, I think we do tend to in libraries undervalue the impact of what we do, you know, and, and, and we can make absolutely massive changes in certain people's lives. For other people, we're just a, a convenience and a, and a piece of entertainment. But for some people, they they go on to do so much. So therefore, I don't think we can over, you know, uh, under undervalue it or overclaim it. I think I think it probably averages out. But I think that's, uh, you know, if this is teaching us something that actually there is a real economic value to what we do and it is measurable and i think if we do some more work and we are going to be working with some of the regional teams to actually flesh out some of the case studies and the research to actually make it a more rounded tool and i think um if we if we use the base camp to sort of start to work together 
um, on, on on how it, it works in our situations. And I've seen some of the, the, the comments about, you know, how does it fit with other evaluation tools? And maybe that base camp will become the evaluation uh, discussion area. And we'll have a set of resources which help people point to social value as well as economic value and things like that. But uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time, Ian. Was there anything you just wanted to wrap up? Um, just a really quick one. So just next steps, just get in there and play with it. Um, I think Nick's kind of covered that bit. Um, but do also talk to Nick and uh, Chad and also Clancy Mason, who will be joining us as Regional Development Manager as well. So talk to the Regional Development Team. If you or your region are looking at trying to commission some more research as well, because then it all brings it together. Um, but finally, just a really big thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, and... And for all the work that I'm sure you'll be doing in the future about how, working out how that can all work together. But then a uh, big thanks to Professors Rick Fordham and John Gordon of UEA um, and um, East of England Libraries, led at the time by Michelle Murphy and now Juliet Perez, but obviously driven a lot by uh, Jill Terrell there. Um, and big thanks to Lily Troop as well uh, for joining us from Norfolk and, and um, being part of a very live and uh, sort of yeah, very live and, and entertaining um, test of the tool. So brilliant. So thank you all. And yeah, do join the, the base camp. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.